Hello, I'm Bill Trainer, Dean of Georgetown University Law Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's comparative constitutional law conversation about the right to health and the Constitution. Comparative constitutional law conversations is a collaboration between Georgetown Law and the Society for Democratic Rights in New Delhi, a collective of lawyers concerned with strengthening democratic and civil rights in India. The Society for Democratic Rights was started by two Georgetown Law alums in New Delhi. And I want to especially thank the mastermind of this series, Viva Data Makajia, LLM class of 92, who's a senior Supreme Court advocate in India, and Associate Dean for Graduate and International Programs, Dean Madhavi Sundar, for launching today's program together. Through these conversations, we look at the role of the highest courts in the world's two largest democracies, and how each approaches the right to health under its constitution. Both the United States and India have an independent judiciary under their constitutional schemes, and their Supreme Courts are among the strongest in the world. We're launching this exciting new series with two conversations via Zoom this month, and plan to follow these with annual in-person events alternating each year between Washington DC and New Delhi. Last Wednesday, we hosted a conversation between Indian Supreme Court Justice Uday Lalit and Georgetown Law Professor and forming act, former Acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal on the role of the Supreme Court in keeping the executive in check. Several thousand people tuned in to hear that enlightening conversation, including extremely distinguished members of the Indian bar and community. And I have to say, I personally learned a great deal from that conversation, including the fact that the Indian Supreme Court reviews 40,000 cases annually, as opposed to the 70, 70 that we do in the United States, uh, the Indian Supreme Court's use of panels to decide cases, the age limit for justices in India, and for me, perhaps most strikingly, the use of judicial review to review constitutional amendments. So for me, and I think for all of us, it was really an extraordinarily enlightening conversation. Today, we're incredibly honored to host to Indian Supreme Court Justice Indu Malhotra, alongside Georgetown's own Professor Larry Gostin, on the right to health and the Constitution. In 2007, Justice Malhotra was designated as a senior advocate by the Supreme Court of India. She became the second woman to be designated by the Supreme Court after over 30 years. In 2018, she was elevated as a judge of the Supreme Court and has a unique status of being the first woman judge to be elevated directly from the bar. Prior to being elevated to the bench, she specialized in the field of arbitration law and has conducted numerous domestic and international commercial arbitrations. Though Indian Supreme Court justices deal with all subject matters sitting in different bench compositions, health law has a special place in her art. And so we are particularly honored to have the justice join us here today. Thank you very much for joining us, Justice. Thank you. And Professor Larry Gostin, Lawrence Gostin, serves as Georgetown University professor, 
the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law, Faculty Director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, and Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law. So welcome, Professor Gostin. Thank you very much, Dean Trainer. It's a pleasure to be here with you and the Justice. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, we've received some questions in advance uh, from our audience, and uh, I'll be asking those among other questions. And members of our audience should please send in questions through the Q&A function, and I will ask as many as, as we have time. So let me begin by talking about the right to health. And let me begin with a large question. What is the right to health? And how does having a right to health impact or empower citizens? So let me begin with the justice and then I'll turn to Professor Gostin. Your Honor. The right to health is not specifically mentioned in the constitution, but it is encompassed in the right to life. So Supreme Court by using its jurisdiction, its original jurisdiction has interpreted the right to life to encompass various aspects of the right to life and right to health has been encompassed in it as being a very integral part of it. And under its PIL jurisdiction, it, there are several, several judgments, I think, uh, you know, hundreds of judgments which have been passed now since the 1970s covering various aspects of the right to health. I mentioned some of them. For instance, there were workers in asbestos factories and mines who started developing the disease of asbestosis. So a PIL came to be filed before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court passed directives for ensuring that their medical tests were done. They were provided certain uh, clothes and certain gear while they were working. They were it was directed that insurance should be provided to these workers. Similarly, there was a carpet industry which used to engage small children because having nimble fingers, the knotting of carpets was uh, considered to be very uh, good with children. And of course, children are paid much less than you know adults. So when this came to light to the Supreme Court, this entire issue was banned, saying it was uh, you know it was very harmful to their health. And in any event, children should not be engaged in these industries and they should you know, be put to education. So several such PILs have been filed from time to time. They continue to be filed now. And in fact, I must say that uh, the jurisprudence of public interest litigation, India actually, the genesis came from the United States. It was in the first few judgments in 1952. The first judgment was, I think, Brown versus Board of Education. And then there were several others, Association of Data Processing Service Organizations versus William Camp. So this concept was borrowed by the Indian Supreme Court from the US Supreme Court, but then we adapted it and developed it. And it has been one of the greatest interpretative tools where any person from the public can approach either the High Court or the Supreme Court directly for enforcement of their fundamental rights if there is any kind of violation, for instance, even when the pandemic broke out and there were issues regarding testing, et cetera, testing being expensive, Supreme Court stepped in and issued certain directions that you must provide it free of cost to the weaker sections of society. And they ensured that a cap was placed because otherwise it would have become too expensive for people to you know, get access to these, um, uh, to these uh, diagnostic methods for the spread of the virus. We have been dealing with it. We treat it as a fundamental right and both the constitutional courts that the High Court and the Supreme Court have passed many, many judgments covering various aspects of the right to health. And is it the basis, is there a textual right to life in yes. the Constitution? Yes, it's a fundamental right. It's a fundamental right, right to life, which is guaranteed to all persons, not only citizens, even non-citizens who live in this country, they're all guaranteed the right to life. Okay, that's uh, that's really, that's fascinating. And so Professor Gostin, the same question, um, the right to health in under the United States Constitution. Yeah, uh, well, let me just uh, step back a minute, if I can, Dean Trainer. I mean, the justice pointed out that uh, 
uh, under the Indian constitution, there is a right to life and the Supreme Court has interpreted that right to life to encompass the idea of essential dignity and basic necessities of life, um, including the right to health, food, water, nutrition, other kinds of uh, essential services. So the Indian Supreme Court has really been a, a leader in that. Um, so has um, South Africa, Brazil, other Latin American countries. Um, currently, there are more than 100 countries in the world that have the right to health or life um, uh, in their constitutions, in their national constitutions. <clears throat> in addition, every country in the world including the United States, which does not have a specific uh, constitutional right to health or life in its constitution, um, has, uh, has ratified at least one treaty on the right to health. That, so literally it includes a binding obligation on every country in the world. The United States you know, doesn't have a, a newer constitution um, like many other countries in the world that have developed a kind of a, a theory of affirmative or positive rights, like the right to life, health, um, uh, the right to a clean, clean environment and things like that. Um, we've you know, famously got what we often call the negative constitution. And for me, the negative constitution was most starkly brought out in, in, a, in the DeShaney case. Um, and that was a case where Justice Blackman had a just an incredible dissent that, that seared in my memory um, where he phrased it as the American negative constitution. And he began by saying, poor Joshua. Joshua was, was a young boy who um, uh, was uh, abused by his father. Um, the social services got many, many reports in Wisconsin of, of uh, his, his abuse. Um, and they just sat on it. They didn't do anything about it. Um, and it became more and more alarming. Finally, uh, Joshua was beaten so badly, he was profoundly mentally disabled and institutionalized. Um, they brought suit against the Wisconsin um, Social Services and the court said that there was no positive right, no duty to protect. Um, there are limited exceptions in the United States. I'm, I'm glad the justice mentioned Brown versus the Board of Education. That's probably um, one of our proudest moments um, uh, for the American Supreme Court. It was really a, a, a wonderful thing where it did kind of, uh, as, as part of that judgment, you know, recognize the importance of education. In the health context, um, prisoners and persons in um, mental, mental uh, uh, institutions who are civilly committed uh, also have modified rights to health because the the theory is, is that because the government has taken away their liberty, it owes them a duty to provide certain basic health services. Uh, and so in the United States, you know, we don't have a robust tradition in our constitution of a right to health or in our litigation in our city. But what we do do um, is focus very, very strongly on areas like equal protection of the law, um, uh, and particularly um, those that involve vulnerable populations. Um, but we're nowhere near um, many of the, the, the democracies like India um, or South Africa in, in our kind of uh, really um, using our constitution as a sword um, to protect the health and the safety of the people the way you do in India, Justice. I mean, that's a, it's a very dramatic difference. Uh, and both in terms of the text, the right to life. Uh, and, you know, I think from the justice and from Professor Gostin, uh, we're hearing uh, really different conceptions about the essence of the constitution. So the, the positive rights of the Indian constitution. And as Professor Gostin says, the US Constitution is almost exclusively about restraints on government as opposed to obligations of government. So very important framing as we go through the right to health. So now um, let me ask uh, one question first for Professor Gostin and then I'll have another question for Justice Mahotra. 
Uh, Professor Gostin, um, COVID has exposed systemic, racial, and other inequalities in healthcare and health impacts. What is the role of courts in addressing these inequalities? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I just had an article last week in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, where we talked about um, how we're going to equitably allocate uh, a COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available. This is both a national problem, but it's also a global problem. And, and if, if we have time, we'll, we should try to get into the global dimensions as well as the national ones. But in the United States, um, people of color, um, mostly uh, black Americans, um, Latinx uh, and uh, indigenous American Indians um, have uh, suffered uh, COVID hospitalization case and death rates at around four times the per capita basis um, as the non-Hispanic white population has. And so many of us believe uh, that um, you need to give some kind of preference to the most disadvantaged and particularly as a proxy for race um, wh when the vaccine comes. And so vaccine the therapeutics um, should be there. The issue is now that there is, um, the, the Supreme Court is really at a precipice about what it thinks about affirmative action and, and race-based um, classifications in terms of uh, allocation of government benefits. Uh, and if race was a specific um, factor um, with a COVID-19 vaccine, it could uh, become litigated. And just today, um, uh, many of you will know, and the justice and of course, uh, Dean Trainer will know, um, that uh, the Senate is, is uh, uh, probably will confirm uh, Justice Amy Comey Barrett to the Supreme Court that will solidify a 6-3 um, a conservative majority. And it's not at all clear what the court would do um, with race-based classifications going forward. Um, but I do think that the United States and the world um, should uh, preference those who have suffered most and particularly um, the poor, the disadvantaged. Um, and so those who have uh, lived in poverty, those who've had high death rates, um, those who um, ha have been essential workers and have been exposed um, to uh, the virus more than we have had to in, in a more privileged setting. Um, that's where um, we should have our uh, efforts. That's true nationally, but it's also true globally. And the World Health Organization has a facility called COVAX. And COVAX is, is a facility that's designed to try to um, uh, make sure that there's equitable global distribution in lower income countries of a COVID-19 vaccine. And when we get to this discussion later on, Bill, I want to point out that to me, India is going to be the driver of this equitable distribution because you have one of the largest pharmaceutical companies, uh, 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 enterprises, perhaps the largest in the world. And you have a, a, a noble tradition of uh, both using compulsory licenses, but also um, for being the generic engine that gets vaccines and drugs equitably to people, not only in India, but in many lower income countries. And so it's, it's a great privilege to be here talking about the comparisons between India and the United States. Yeah, I think that that's a wonderful answer. And just a couple of things I wanna highlight. Um, when you talk about what's gonna happen in the United States, it's very much the constitutional clause is equal protection. So it, it says that people have to be treated equally. So it's not, a, it's not a right to health, but when the vaccines are being provided, they've gotta be equitably distributed. But uh, while in the past, there's been recognition that race can be a factor that's considered in making decisions, the Supreme Court right now as it's becoming more conservative may no longer recognize that. So this may be a moment in which, and you argued your article that you just came out, I think it was last week is very yeah. powerful. 
uh, made the argument for essentially recognizing the disparate impact of COVID. One question is whether the court will recognize that. Uh, and then I think also the other point that you had, which is very important is the centrality of India uh, in the way in which the world responds to the virus and the vaccine. So, and that's, we'll be focusing on that, you know, very much in this conversation. But Justice, um, let me ask you another question. Um, the abrupt cessation of all economic movement and social interaction because of the coronavirus pandemic had the greatest impact on India's more than 375 million migrant workers and other vulnerable populations. The nation's Supreme Court had warned that the frantic migration of hundreds of thousands of migrant workers from India's largest cities is becoming, quote, a bigger problem, that's in quotes, than the coronavirus outbreak itself. How did the courts in India respond to this unexpected consequence of the government's response to COVID-19? Well, as I just mentioned a little while ago, when this mass migration took place, because the, there was an, a complete lockdown, so the entire source of living and you know funding, the wages went. So these people could not afford to stay in the cities or in the urban areas. So native places. Now there were no trains, there were no buses, nothing was flying. So a lot of them took to walking back thousands of kilometers. So the minute this happened and it came to light, the Supreme Court passed a slew of directions. They issued notice to the central government, they issued notice to the state governments, directed the state governments that you please make available food for them, make available buses for them. And the central government was asked to uh, start flying the trains. So there were these special trains, which are called the Shramik trains, which were immediately put into operation for the transportation of the migrant labor. Then the state governments were directed by the Supreme Court because uniform directions were passed for the entire country because we're a federal structure. So uh, directions were issued to the state government that please maintain a database about these migrant labor, whether they are skilled, whether they are unskilled, because all that data would be important and relevant for their rehabilitation. And, uh, you know, after the lockdown was lifted, they arranged a lot of NGOs funded to bring them back by air because entire economic activity had come to a standstill. So Supreme Court monitored it. So the first thing they did was with respect to providing transportation, easing the uh, situation for them. Uh, it directed the central government that if the journey takes more than 12 hours, provide food. Otherwise, food was not being given because of the danger of the spread of the virus. And uh, so one was transportation. Then second was quarantining uh, all these people when they reached their destinations. So that was facilitated. And third was with respect to testing of people, especially the underprivileged. The Supreme Court issued directions to all private and government hospitals that you will not charge them any amount. And then a cap was put subsequently because the private hospitals were charging uh, 4,500 per, per, per test of the RT-PCR test. So Supreme Court said, no, you will have to bring it down, make it affordable so that the entire public, because see, these tests are not a one-off test. You, can, you may have to test for it repetitively. So a cap was directed to be put because of a national emergency. And now no hospital charges more than 2,400, making it far more affordable. So these were some of the steps which were uh, taken. Supreme Court issued directions under its extraordinary jurisdiction under Article 32 uh, to the entire country. And they have the force of law under Article 142 of our constitution. So again, I think we see a very significant difference between the responses of the two judicial systems. Uh, the decisions that the justice has spoken of, very consequential, very important. Um, and what Professor Gostin is talking about is what may lie ahead, but um, you know, there are real questions about whether the court will respond to kind of economic and racial impacts. So a very good framing of the differences between our two systems. Um, Professor Gostin, uh, we just received this question from Kevin Clark, who's the governing legal counsel and vice president 
of the National Institute of Health, the NIH. And I just want to say, it's just the fact that we've received uh, a question from uh, Kevin Clark reflects how significant our audience is. Um, uh, he writes that you noted this morning that the Supreme Court of the United States with its new complement of justices could prefer uh, economic and religious freedoms over public health. Um, is, that, is that a fair statement? And is that something that you anticipate? Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes, I, I know Kevin and I actually just tweeted about that very thing this morning. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court, um, first of all, there have been, there have been um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of legal challenges to emergency health powers during the COVID pandemic in the United States. Um, for the most part, the courts have deferred uh, to public health uh, authorities and they've used the you know, seminal case, uh, 1905 case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts, um, which was a mandatory vaccination for smallpox. Um, um, but uh, the, you know, in that same term, uh, uh, the court also uh, uh, announced a, a kind of use of economic freedoms um, as, as a heightened um, liberty interest in the United States. One that the court, the Supreme Court has, has never, at least in uh, modern history, um, abided by. Um, now, um, the court is going to have to be uh, hearing with a 6-3 majority um, a number of cases that are filtering up um, that, do that do worry me. One of them has to do with religious um, liberty. Uh, in uh, just this year, uh, the, our Supreme Court decided two COVID-related cases, um, both of them with five to four majorities with Chief Justice Roberts swinging to the liber liberal bloc um, to support a public health power. They all um, involved um, whether or not uh, bans on gatherings uh, as applied to a religious worship um, violated the, uh, free ex the freedom of religion clause in the United States constitution um, or whether public health had an exception. Um, so that was a very narrow five to four majority. Um, uh, Justice Barrett is well known for um, uh, thinking very strongly about the importance of religious uh, liberty. And so I worry about that and particularly not just with COVID, but also with um, uh, uh, states that do not require um, religious exemptions to uh, childhood vaccinations, for example. Uh, or if we had a COVID mandate, whether or not religions would be exempted from that, or whether they'll, they'll be exempted going forward from uh, 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 public gathering uh, bans and other bans. The, at the same time, there have been cases, for example, in Michigan and other, other uh, states, Pennsylvania, um, about whether or not um, uh, the uh, economic freedom uh, was one that deserved uh, particular uh, attention and focus. Uh, and that could come up to the Supreme Court as well. Um, at, so that closure of businesses and other kinds of COVID related or public related health related activities, what the Supreme Court will do with that. And this is true all over the world. I think all courts are gonna be faced with uh, looking at the question, how far can public health authorities go in the face of a, a pandemic and the exercise of emergency powers. Now, in the United States, after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, I wrote the model emergency health powers law for the CDC, which has been adopted widely in the US and globally. And I anticipated many of the things that we're seeing today, but I could never have even imagined uh, the city size of Delhi or the country the size of India would be locked down, or Beijing, or New York, or London, or Paris. Um, but that's what we're seeing today. And the courts are gonna to be asked to arbitrate these things going forward. 
And I think in the United States, it's very consequential because we're really seeing two movements at the same time. Uh, the response to the pandemic is pushing towards very powerful constraints. Uh, at the same time, we're looking at a Supreme Court that you know, may, as you point out, be focused more on protection of economic liberties and religious liberties than we've seen in many years. So we'll see how this evolves over time, but it's very consequential. And as you say, it's also a global phenomenon. Uh, you know, the question of how, where does the line get drawn? Uh, so let me turn to you, Justice. Um, how does the Supreme Court of India balance individual liberties with more collective public health measures, at least in normal times? In normal times, it depends because of groups, they are dealt with differently because there have been various uh, petitions which have been filed by certain bodies, uh, NGOs, public spirited persons. So when a group action comes, then general directions have been passed. For instance, there was this challenge to the LGBT issue. So this is a group uh, action. So the Supreme Court, a constitution bench of five judges sat and they said that it was actually a relic of the colonial past when ships. And we struck that down and said that, uh, you know, we said it is uh, not criminal. It is a sexual orientation is also a facet of life. And if that's how a person is, they are entitled to their identity. So there are many, many group action cases which come. For instance, uh, there was a PIL file wherein they said that, uh, you know, a public a, a smoking in public places must be banned. So in the absence of legislation, the Supreme Court issued directions saying that in no public place, whether it's an auditorium or, uh, you know, a cinema hall, etc., there can be no smoking. So it, the legislation came, but it came subsequently. So pro tem measures were passed under our constitutional powers, and it was completely stopped until the legislation came after some years. Then another issue of group rights is regarding protection of women from sexual harassment at the workplace, the Supreme Court issued directions which were pro tem in nature. And it was after 16 years that the legislation was enacted by parliament, a central legislation, uh, you know, saying that you cannot uh, exploit women. And it's uh, an expression of the right to dignity of a woman that, you know, this should be, um, it was considered, they had issued various directions as to how to deal with it. So these group rights keep coming from time to time so also do individual rights. Now, the point is that, you know, who brings, suppose, uh, and these group rights normally have been brought, especially when it happens in the poverty-stricken areas, the depressed uh, classes who are unable to access justice. The courts have lowered the concept of, uh, you know, local standi, and they have permitted any public-spirited person to move the courts the constitutional courts, the high court, and the Supreme Court for relief. And uh, we have always intervened, but we are mindful that it should not be someone who's doing it, who's actuated with some private interest, or is some busybody or an interloper who's doing it for other reasons. So we have to be very, very cautious and circumspect about that. And we do certainly, we are discerning, we find out, you know, whether the person is genuinely espousing a public cause and we do interfere and issue directions which are pro tem in nature until legislation comes and occupies the field for instance the cigarette issue the, the sexual harassment so then the transgender issue on group rights now in so far as an individual is concerned the courts have interfered only if a genuine person is able to move the court saying that uh, you know such and such person is economically depressed, he's not able to access justice to the court, and we do interfere in individual cases also. For instance, there was an NGO went, uh, which went and started conducting sterilization in Bihar. So a petition was filed, and so we said, no, the right to reproductive choices is an innate aspect of the right to life, and we said this was illegal, you can't do it without counseling, you've not even informed the women who are going through this sterilization as to what it entails. So it depends on who comes. 
if we find it's genuine and bona fide, when they, we normally, as a matter of uh, discretion, we would direct them to first go to the court of first instance, which is the high court, which have similar powers for enforcement of fundamental rights. If there are group actions, which are spread over the entire country, then the Supreme Court normally steps in. That's the, that's the way we, uh, you know, uh, conduct these cases. So again, it's different both, I think, in terms of the rights that are protected, uh, and then also the doctrine of standing, which in the United States is very much of a restriction on who can bring suit. Uh, and India takes a very different approach. Uh, so that's and actually hearing and working through that. It's very striking, uh, you know, as somebody who's just familiar with the U.S. system. I'll interrupt you for a moment. Uh -huh. the of locus standi has only been relaxed with respect to public interest issues and not otherwise. Mm. If it's vote, et cetera, local standard is a very strict principle to be followed. It's only on issues of public interest where pe persons are not able to move the court or gain access to justice and the courts that we permit local standard to be relaxed. It's only in this case. Yeah, that's fascinating, very important. Um, okay, well, thank you. So. So we've, we've started by talking about kind of the constitutional framework and uh, and also focusing more recently or uh, specifically on pandemic related questions. Um, the two topics that I wanna to move to now, patents in public health, and then I wanna talk about some upcoming cases questions, but let me begin with patents in public health. Um, in 2013, both the US and Indian Supreme Courts heard important cases on patents and public health. In Novartis versus Union of India, a monumental 112 page decision, the Supreme Court of India mentioned health 33 times and interpreted the Indian patent law to recognize human rights and a right to access life-saving medicines, especially for the country's poor. In the United States, in Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics, the US Supreme Court struck down a patent in isolated breast cancer genes, but never mentioned health once. How did the Indian and US Supreme Court strike the balance between patents and public health? So let me start with the justice and then ask uh, Professor Gostin to answer the question. So your honor. A perspective which the courts normally take is to have to keep in mind that India has a very vast population of over 1.3 billion people and a large number of them are in the poorer classes who are unable to get access because if these uh, medicines are patented they become far more expensive. So the issue becomes balancing between the commercial interests of the manufacturer and the public health of the public at large. So that is very, very primary for us. And that was the reason why the patenting in the Novartis case was refused because it was a life-saving cancer drug and it would have become absolutely impossible for the poorer classes to even afford it. So it was a matter of the right to life and right to health that Supreme Court uh, said that for India, it is of primary concern that public health has to be given priority over commercial interests. That is basically the perspective which we have taken. Okay, thank you. And Professor Gostin? Yeah, I mean, uh, Dean Tran, you've raised two. I, I, love the, I love the justice, how you, you put together the Indian Novartis case and, our, uh, and the Supreme Court case on genetics. And I hadn't even realized that the U.S. Supreme Court never mentioned health in its judgment. That is, that is really quite remarkable. Um, but but I think that you know, India um, has a and it and its legal system has a much greater tradition of uh, protecting the common good and particularly access to affordable um, uh, medicines and vaccines. There's no question that of all the Supreme Courts in the world, the highest courts in the world, that India has been the most active in trying to uh, limit the uh, unaffordable, ac uh, unaffordable access to, to um, 
uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and it's been a big issue within the country. In the United States, you know, we, as, as we've said repeatedly, our constitution doesn't provide for the right to health or the right to life or anything like that. And so there's no, we're not balancing uh, <coughs> Uh, business rights and, and intellectual property versus health. What we're trying to do, what the Supreme Court's trying to do is literally interpret um, uh, patent statutes and intellectual property statutes that Congress has already enacted. <coughs> this case, um, it was actually a very interesting case that you raised. You know, the question there really wasn't about the affordability or, or health aspects of a drug. The question was, whether or not you could patent something, a genetic, a, a, a genetic strain that was actually found in nature. Um, and so the Supreme Court said that you know, something is just simply you know, plucked out of nature and you, you do a, genetics, a genetic sequencing of it, that in and of itself is not patentable. But if you add certain intellectual value to it, for example, the, 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 the sequencing data that, that you have as, a, as an original methodology, that original methodology could be patentable. Uh, we diverge a little bit on that question from Europe, for example. Um, but what is striking is really the way you frame the question so beautifully, um, which is that India talks about health constantly and affordability of medicines whereas that's really not an issue in the United States. And then globally, uh, you may be getting to this, but if, you, if you're not, I, I, I would want us to discuss it, is the idea of TRIPS flexibilities um, under uh, 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 World Trade Organization uh, rules. Um, uh, we protect uh, intellectual property, um, but under the Doha Declaration and TRIPS flexibilities, um, we uh, countries are able to declare national emergencies and compulsorily license um, medications. India has been the, the global leader in that. And the United States is often pushed behind the scenes and even publicly against the idea of uh, compulsory licenses, preferring instead to make sure that uh, pharmaceutical companies can protect their intellectual property rights. And that's a very live and very important issue and will be absolutely um, when we have uh, innovative COVID vaccines and therapeutics. I could absolutely foresee a country like India declaring a compulsory license hmm. if there was any attempt to, to create intellectual property rights around a, a valuable vaccine. That's interesting. Let me follow up on that with you, Professor Gossin, and then to the justice. Um, do you envision litigation over access to COVID-19 vaccine treatment uh, in the near future, or is that already a settled question? And how might India and the United States differ? So Professor Gostin and then uh, the justice. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I have no doubt that there will be a lot of uh, litigation, um, not just in the United States or India, but probably globally around this issue. Um, because what we're going to see um, is that we're probably going to get a COVID vaccine approved um, probably in the United States and in Europe um, and in China, which is already given emergency use authorization and Russia has as well uh, to COVID vaccines. Um, but there's going to be uh, a lot of scarcity. Um, and the scarcity is going to mean that we're gonna have to make hard choices at the beginning about who gets access to the vaccines. The courts are absolutely gonna be um, uh, called upon to do this. Now, normally in the United States, it's hard to see any of this litigation actually winning at the highest levels of the Supreme Court, unless it's the kind of um, affirmative action race-based classifications um, that currently uh, the National Academy of Sciences and the Nat National Vaccine Advisory Board of uh, the CDC has, has explicitly used 
race as one of several factors. Mm. Now, as you said, uh, Dean Trainer, the, the court in the past has allowed in higher education using race as one of several factors in admissions um, to give preference um, to uh, uh, people of color. Uh, but that's not absolutely certain that that will persist going forward in the, in the Supreme Court. And I envisage a, a court that is suspicious of race-based classifications. And so I think that will be a really crucial issue. Um, already the United States, I think to its credit, and I will give us credit, as far as our national distribution plans are using disadvantage um, very strongly in our allocation strategies. Um, whether that breaks down in the future, I don't know, but I can see for, I can foresee a lot of litigation around it. And then certainly um, I would see it uh, in other countries, but particularly uh, other countries that are left uh, basically with extreme shortages of vaccines because the other side of this really complex puzzle uh, is the fact that the United States primarily, but also the UK, European countries and others have already signed um, advanced purchasing agreements with pharmaceutical companies to supply the American market before other global markets, including India, uh, Latin America and other uh, lower income countries. And what you will see from that is vast inequities Mm. Uh, and how the global order and, and how international rules could impact that and how a court like the Indian Supreme Court might re, uh, uh, resort, uh, how reply to that is interesting. So let's speculate for a moment and then hear the, the wonderful wise words of the justice. Um, you know, so we might speculate that there's a, a, a problem with uh, scarcity of the vaccine, uh, the United States and other countries have hoarded the vaccine. Um, at the same time, there is intellectual property rights. Might India um, uh, declare a compulsory license, not only for its own country, but also to export the vaccine to other low and middle income countries? I can absolutely foresee that happening. I can't predict it for sure, but India is often thought to be you know, uh, a global citizen in relation to uh, vaccines and therapeutics. On this well, thank issue, you. Your Honor. I, on this issue, I will avoid giving any opinion because it will be the source of litigation which we'll have to deal with the courts. So I would not like to opine on this issue at all. Okay, very I good. That might be the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, there I have some audience questions, but before we do that, just because it, it, it's an important issue on everybody's mind in the United States. Um, next month, uh, the United States Supreme Court will be hearing oral arguments in California versus Texas, which is a defining case for the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, we've talked about the United States not having a right to health, but we do have this statutory framework that's now under challenge. Um, what impact could this case have on health care in the United States? Professor Gaston? Yeah, um, I thought about that a lot. You know, I mean, I think that, that, the, that the nightmare scenario um, is, is that the Supreme Court would, would invalidate the entire Affordable Care Act, including its, uh, its protection against exclusions uh, for people with pre-existing conditions. And that's been the big uh, political uh, discussion point. Um, and particularly with uh, Justice Barrett on the court, whether the court might shift that way. Um, I'm myself um, doubtful that the court will do that. And let me explain why. Um, right now, the issue before the Supreme Court has to do with uh, Congress zeroing, zeroing out the tax penalty for the individual mandate. And so we, effectively don't have a tax penalty for that mandate now. As you'll recall, when the Supreme Court um, upheld the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, it said, and I think in my view, in a very mistaken way, um, that the Affordable Care Act was not constitutional under the commerce powers, but under the taxing powers. 
And that's what got uh, Justice Roberts to flip over to give the 5-4 uh, decision in favor of, of upholding the act. I think I always thought that was wrong. And I was always very worried about uh, using the taxing power in that way. Well, now um, Congress has zeroed out the tax. So there is no tax. And so the question is, would the individual mandate stand? I think it won't because there's no tax penalty for it. But then does that mean that the entire Affordable Care Act falls? Now here, I think the court will look at the uh, doctrine of severability and whether or not you, that Congress intended um, when it zeroed out the tax penalty to invalidate the entire Affordable Care Act. I think it's almost inconceivable that the Congress had that intent because Congress had literally over a hundred chances to repeal the act and it never did. And there was no discussion during uh, the zeroing, zeroing out of the tax penalty that uh, there was any discussion of whether or not Congress had intended um, to have this affect the entire Affordable Care Act. So although there is a great concern um, among the Biden camp and the political left in the United States that the Affordable Care Act will, will go down, my betting is, is that the Supreme Court will be more judicious um, and, uh, up and strike down the individual mandate, but leave the rest of the Affordable Care Act up. Of course, it might not, and we don't know what will happen. But if it doesn't, the United States would be in a crisis because we would have no national health system. So it could be a very consequential decision. And I Absolutely. think you've identified the risk that it is run. Um, so now let me turn to some of the questions which have come in from our audience. Uh, so let me begin two questions that have come in for the justice. Um, and I'll read both of them. Uh, are doctors required to provide care to non-emergency patients? And is there any recognition of a right to menstrual health? Uh, question was with respect to emergency? Non-emergency. Uh, are doctors required to provide care to non-emergency patients? Okay. So uh, we have passed a judgment in a case where in, with respect to an emergency case, all private and government hospitals have been mandated to provide first aid. But non-emergency cases, there is no such uh, direction passed because private uh, parties have, you know, have the right to run their hospitals and clinics as they please. But government hospitals are under an obligation to provide medical care. So that is with respect to, uh, you know, non-emergency cases, there is no such direction which is passed because they are, you know, run by their own private funds. So they're entitled to run the way they please. We don't really, there are no directions passed by the court on this. And uh, governments also do not uh, really curtail their power to run it as they consider it necessary, because these are there are a lot of specialist hospitals. In fact, India's medical care facilities are very good. We have a very vast medical tourism, which comes to India from various uh, parts of the world, from England, from the Middle East, etc., for medical care. So there are no curbs or curtailments on private uh, hospitals running their institutions in the best manner that they choose. And uh, your second question was with respect to uh, menstrual health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with respect to that, the government has passed various directions to improve upon it, make it complete. It's very, very inexpensive. They provided for all kinds of measures, but that's not something which the courts have really delved into. The government has been, has been taking a lot of measures. Very good, okay. Um, so I think we're almost out of time. So let me ask one final question to both of you and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Viva Data Mahija for some concluding remarks. Um, this is from our audience. Uh, should essential workers, especially healthcare workers, be vaccinated first in all countries? So first Professor Gaston and then the justice. The shorter answer is yes, and they will be. Um, already uh, in, in countries that have uh, given emergency use authorization in China and Russia, um, they were prioritized in the United States. 
our current um, uh, uh, CDC guide, CDC um, uh, recommendations are that healthcare workers will uh, be uh, first in line for the vaccine. I think the World Health Organization follows the same course. So the answer is a, a definitive yes, and they should be. And would you I, agree with this? Yes, I would certainly con uh, concur with what uh, Professor Gostin said. And I think this is the universal thinking that they are in the first line, they are the caregivers, and they are the most vulnerable segment in society today. So they definitely have to be given priority over all others. I would certainly concur with him. And I think this is a, 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 it's quite a universal opinion. In fact, uh, I was reading certain newspaper reports. The government also has placed them right on top in priority of being provided the vaccine first. Well, very good. Well, that's, um, this has been a remarkable discussion. Uh, and I have to say it's the conversation between our two countries and focusing in on the work of the Supreme Courts and on the right to health at any time would have been important. At this moment, it's so powerful, so significant. Uh, and I have to say, as somebody from the United States system, I, we have much to learn from India. So I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Professor Gostin for you know who's just such an extraordinary leader in the global health field for sharing your insights and your thoughts uh, and Your Honor Justice Malhotra really a remarkable insightful and powerful uh, thank you so much so um, this was great um, and I and it's such a privilege for me to be part of it and now uh, I'd like to turn matters over. Uh, to, uh, you know, at the very beginning, I said Dean Sunder and our mastermind, um, uh, Viva Data Makija, uh, helped us conceptualize this and put it together. Um, let me now call you for some, uh, some concluding remarks. But again, Professor Gostin, Justice, thank you so much for a conversation that was so powerful and I learned so much from. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Good evening. Thank you, Bill. That was a wonderful conversation. In fact, uh, I think what we have learned are the two approaches of the two countries. And I certainly feel proud to be a part of this country where our health issues, affordability, accessibility are a bigger priority than the commercialization of medical care. And uh, I definitely thank Justice Palotra for, you know, joining us because despite their heavy workload, they have, uh, you know, she's made time for us and Professor Gostin, it was just wonderful to hear your thoughts. And thank you, Bill, for making this uh, come true. And of course, Mark Wiesender, who's uh, helped us throughout this entire thing. I also have uh, the Georgetown team, the Live Law team, and the SDR team to thank because they've put in a lot of work in this series. I hope we have physical um, interactions the next year. I look forward to that. Thank you very much. And of course, I have to thank the audience because we've had a really distinguished audience. We've had uh, you know, uh, justices from the high court. We've had very uh, distinguished uh, senior advocates from the Supreme Court. They have all joined us here. And this was most enlightening uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Well, very good. So this is uh, Georgetown's 150th uh, anniversary. As you can see, the 150th banner uh, behind me. And we wanted to showcase the kind of contributions and intellectual dialogue that is at the core of Georgetown law. And this dialogue, this series, and today's conversation is an example of what Georgetown is so proud of. So again, thank you, Viva. Thank you, Professor Gostin. Thank you, Your Honor. And we look forward